Um, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine over 100 days ago, I've been thinking a lot about how we got here. And especially the ways in which culture war, um, those debates that managed to dehumanize everyone, have been involved in fueling the Russian propaganda machine. And that's sort of what my thoughts are about today. So I'm going to start with an antidote that I think I heard in a medieval, in a Middle Eastern history class in college, um, but I have been unable to independently verify anywhere. But um, it works for the story, so I'm going to tell it anyway. In 11th century Baghdad, a group of local mullahs began to teach based on their interpretation of a few verses of the Quran and Hadith that eclipses are unpredictable events. This is, of course, patently untrue. Human beings have been able to predict eclipses for a long time. In fact, if the markings are on some caves in modern Iraq are to be believed, Neanderthals were perfectly capable of predicting such astronomical phenomena. <laughs> Do you, want, do you want to stop for dinner or no? No? Okay. Um, so Neanderthals are capable of predicting such astronomical phenomena. Islamic law, notably, requires astronomers to release the dates and times of major astronomical events to prevent superstitious panic. Of course, the fact that the people of 11th century Baghdad, including those mullahs, had seen eclipses predicted and come to pass didn't stop the mullahs from teaching this. Instead, they kept right on sharing this false interpretation. We know all about this because the great Islamic philosopher Al-Qadabri al-Baghdadi took offense. He penned an open letter, which also happens to be the favorite genre of online Orthodox Christianity, to the mullahs demanding that they stop promulgating their false teachings. They needed to stop, al-Baghdadi said, not only because it made them out to be liars, though that clearly should have been a problem, but because al-Baghdadi rightly saw that once people realized the mullahs were lying about something so easily verifiable, while using the Quran as justification, they would not only cease to believe the mullahs, they would cease to believe in the revelation of the Quran and ultimately in God. I mention this story because I think it speaks to what it is the heart of the current problem with regard to the position of Christianity writ large within the landscape of global culture war. There is little doubt that Christianity is dying in its traditional strongholds in Europe and the Americas. While majority Orthodox countries, most of which are in Eastern Europe and the Balkans, which have been less affected by this phenomenon, continue to produce high levels of religious identification, religious faith, and particularly religious practice are another matter entirely. Cultural orthodoxy is, as the kids say, very much a thing. And it isn't clear what, and isn't it clear why people are so disenchanted? When, speaking with the authority of the church, you tell people things that are clearly not true, things that are verifiably untrue, things that you can prove false with your own eyes, doesn't it follow that they will cease to believe anything you have to say? So what kind of untrue things are the black-robed men of the church and their allies saying? And here's where I get a bit indelicate, as anyone who's seen anything I've written or said ever um, knows I'm capable of. So if you're the sensitive sort, now would be the time to cover your ears. Once upon a time, the, the debates that animated the Christian world were about things like the nature of Christ and the mechanics of salvation. Interesting things, theologically relevant things, but at the end of the day, topics that are not necessarily subject to empirical evidence. Well, no more. Thanks to the culture wars, every major public debate, and by this I mean debates that don't just concern academics and people who have read entirely too many texts written before 1500, i.e. my people, all of these kind of debates in the Christian world seem to be about gender and sexuality. Every single one. 
So how did we get here? Well, the Orthodox, well, for Orthodox Christianity, at least for the past century, but arguably since the fall of Constantinople in 1453, there's been an internal struggle over, question, over the question of if and how Orthodox Christians can reconcile themselves to liberalism and modernity. This is a struggle not unlike that within Islam, right down to its violent consequences. But in recent years, this native conflict has been coupled with Orthodox Christianity's own personal theater in the culture wars. That American-born struggle between what I'm going to call cultural traditionalists and cultural reformers that has been going on since the end of World War I, but really got hot around the time of the Cold War. Since the early 1990s, Western Christian debates surrounding cultural issues, particularly those about gender and sexuality, all of which emerge out of the culture wars, right, have been imported into the Orthodox world. And these issues have quickly come to dominate the conversation because sex is interesting, just as they did in Western Christendom. This has happened in two primary ways. The first is the conversion of conservative, culture war-minded people from Western Christian traditions, like the Episcopal Church, um, predominantly cultural traditionalists who lost their culture war debates within their tradition, and po the post-Soviet engagement of American evangelicals with Russian Orthodoxy. Nothing bears witness to the extent to which culture wars have been important to Orthodoxy more than Patriarch Carell's truly absurd Forgiveness Sunday homily this year, which has gotten too much press, so I'm reluctant to bring it up yet again, but here I go. Inga knows I love to beat a dead horse. When he bizarrely claimed, and quite cruelly, if we're being quite honest, that the war in Ukraine was necessary to prevent gay parades. First, not to be too literal, if he was talking about pride parades, which I imagine he is, Kiev has had a pride parade since 2013. There are pictures, and if I was slightly more organized, I would have a PowerPoint to show you those pictures, but you have Google. But what, 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 about, but what was he actually, what was he, else was he saying, other than this not true thing about pride parades in Kiev? At a basic and cynical level, the patriarch was simply attempting to deflect from Russia's grave moral failing, failing, and arguably his own complicity in it, by scapegoating a marginalized minority. The truth is, after all, the war in Ukraine is not because gay people exist or even because they have parades. The truth is that there's a war going on right now in Ukraine because of Vladimir Putin's, and dare I say, Patriarch Karel's, unbridled lust for power. Their sin, not random par parade participants' sin, gay or otherwise. And the connection between homophobia and the war in Ukraine is not just, just Patriarch Karel's idiotic sermon. Russia's last real friend in the European Union is Viktor Orban, who recently prevented Patriarch Karel from falling under EU sanctions. Orban is a violent homophobe and has identified the traditional family as the common cause and LGBT, and LGBT people as the common enemy of Russia and his own Hungary. And by the way, the same is true for those American conservatives, like American conservative editor Rod Dreher, who either have offered tepid condemnation of the war in Ukraine, they understand, but they think the killing part is bad, or no condemnation at all. What binds Russia's friends list is homophobia. What Lisa Frank folders were to suburban white girls in the early 1990s, homophobia is to authoritarians to say today. Maybe not the only thing they have in common, but certainly their favorite thing to talk about. But I think there's more at work here than good old fashioned bigotry, and that's worth talking about too. Not only because it's being used as cover for Orthodox Christians launching missiles at other Orthodox Christians, but because if we want to save our tradition from becoming yet another piece of cannon fodder in a war against modernity that no one can win, we have to start talking frankly and honestly about how we found ourselves in this position in the first place and why we can't seem to break free. Oscar Wilde rightly observed that everything in the world is about sex, except sex. Sex is about power. 
which is why anyone who's ever been interested in any kind of power has sought to control sex. There are many good historical explanations for the radical changes in sexual ethic we have seen since the Industrial Revolution. The loss of control, the loss of control over people's sex lives experienced by both secular and ecclesiastical power. Everyone, regardless of sexual identity or behavior, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, which decoupled one's economic production from the biological family, enjoys more sexual choice than our forebearers could have ever dreamed of. Make no mistake about it, a heterosexual marriage chosen freely by each partner and founded upon mutual love and respect is just as non-traditional, non-biblical, whatever that means, and fundamentally modern as a marriage between two people of the same sex. I grew up in a community in which the shift away from traditional marriage had only taken place a couple of generations before. And many people my grandparents' age, including many beloved great aunts and uncles, were in actual traditional marriages. Marriages arranged by families aimed at securing progeny and economic stability. Marriages in which women were nearly always stripped of any freedom of choice or power over their lives and bodies. Those relationships could not have been more different in norms and expectations than the love match marriages that many of those same aunts and uncles reminded me, often derisively, was my grandparents' marriage. And my grandparents' marriage, I'm not afraid to say, was better than those traditional marriages, particularly for my grandmother, who was not expected to play the role of servant, child, or brood mare who was treated by her husband as a whole person, whom he not only loved, but liked and respected, who, no matter what happened in her life, at least was allowed the knowledge that she chose her life. I saw that. I observed the difference and discerned the moral distinction. No amount of traditionalist protestation could convince me that this was untrue. In the same way, I have seen plenty of marriages between people of the same sex that are, well, a lot like my grandparents' marriage, which is to say, pretty damn good. And I have known and loved gay and lesbian people living observably good lives. I have seen it with my own eyeballs, and I'm guessing many of you have too, which is why it should ring very hollow when Patri Patriarch Carell tells you that we have to kill babies in Ukraine to stop those people and stop those marriages from existing. And it should ring hollow in less extreme cases as well. When you are told that gay people and gay relationships are innately disordered and depraved, that shouldn't just offend your sense of decency. That should offend your sense of reality. And yet for far too many of our co-religionists, that doesn't happen. And that failure, that failure to hold up our church, official, our church, our clergy and theologians and public personas like Rod Dreher and Frederica Matthew Green to the reality we've experienced, that's how we got here. As Orthodox Christians, anti-Semitism and homophobia in particular are our gateway drugs. We have allowed them to become so part and parcel within our culture that we have no cultural reflex to any absurdity uttered in their defense, in defense of our favorite, two favorite kinds of xenophobia. Voltaire, certainly no fan of religion, but incredibly witty, and as good in French as he is in English, said that those who, who will make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And so here we are committing atrocities because we allowed ourselves to believe absurdities we could have easily disproven by just looking around us. I will be frank. I was considering giving an entirely different talk, more of a histor strictly historical rundown of the relationship between Orthodox Christians in Russia and beyond and American cultural warriors. I think that's what I was actually recruited to do. It seemed less risky and it was a good way to be the token Greek in the situation. Every time, but because every time I publicly written or talked about the chasmic divide between what the institutional teaches, church teaches with regard to gender and sexuality, particularly homosexuality, and what I simply have observed in my own life as a, and this may come as a shock to many of you, pretty conservative, straight, Greek American girl from the suburbs. 
the reaction I've received from certain corners has been bizarre. And it is nothing compared to the reactions my openly gay and lesbian Orthodox friends and colleagues regularly receive when they, I don't know, speak about anything on any topic in any vaguely Orthodox space. Which explains why the chief bishop of the Russian Orthodox Church thought he might get away with scapegoating gay people as the cause of an illegal war. We have to fight back against this. I understand that there are complex theological and cultural issues to work through with respect to the full sacramental inclusion and participation of gay and lesbian people in the Orthodox Church, just like I understand that the debates around the anti-Semitism built into our liturgical tradition require real scholarly debate. But we cannot demand people disbelieve what they've seen with their own eyes. Because when we are asking them to disbelieve, especially when we are asking them to disbelieve in other people's humanity, it is mind blowing to me that this is somehow a question. Every single person in Ukraine is in grave danger. But there is a unique kind of danger for gender and sexual minorities that the gender and sexual minorities now face with the threat of Russian um, occupation. Um, a Russia who has made it no secret that LGBT people in the Ukraine are at the top of the, their hit list. And that's not to mention, I mean, these are not unfounded fears. We know what's been going on in Russia and Chechnya with, with Russia's approval um, to sexual and gender minorities. So I'm going to end this, my little, my little part of the evening, with what folks in the fundraising business call a call to action. Kyiv Pride is Ukraine's leading LGBT rights organization and they are bravely continuing to operate on the ground in Ukraine today. And anyone who's operating in Ukraine on the ground today is very brave. And they need our help, which is a nice way of saying they need our money. You have Google, Kiev, so Google Kiev Pride and give them money. We cannot undo the damage that the complicity in our tradition has done to ramp up homophobia or to provide cover to Russian propaganda but we can ensure that there's less damage going forward, or at least we can try. Thank you.